Good morning to you in America, good afternoon to those in Europe, and good evening to those from the Far East, and a very warm welcome to you all to today's webinar, which we have titled uh, The European Hydrogen Market, A New Gold Rush. My name is Benjamin Lowe, I'm Director of International Partnerships at Solar Power Events, and I have the pleasure of welcoming today's experts from the hydrogen industry, uh, Dr. Carola Kantz, Deputy Managing Director, VDMA Power to X for Applications Working Group. Heinrich Gärtner, who is CTO and co-founder of JP Jewel, as well as CEO of Hartech Systems. And Thomas Krometzka, Head of Strategy at Anapta. Welcome, everyone. Well, after the recent presentation of the German National Hydrogen Strategy and yesterday's announcement by the European Union about its hydrogen strategy, one must surely have the impression of a new hydrogen gold rush. The share prices of some of the leading hydrogen companies have shot through the roof and on top of this, industry giants such as ThyssenKrupp seem to be falling over each other to announce new partnerships and initiatives. But what do these strategies mean for those working in the hydrogen industry? Are these strategies too little too late or are these the missing pieces in our quest to decarbonize the mobility and energy sectors and finally propel the hydrogen industry into the mainstream? To help us get a better understanding of what this all means for the energy industry, we aim to give you some insights today into what these new policies really mean and where does the market stand and as well as looking at potentially what still needs to be done before then taking your questions in a Q&A session towards the end. We plan for a webinar of roughly 45 minutes to an hour um, and hope to have enough time to take your questions. We shall therefore begin with a presentation from Dr. Carola Kanz, who will take us through the German and EU strategy. Carola, thank you, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ben, um, and a very good evening from uh, from Brussels, uh, where I'm based. I'm um, a member of the. I'm working for the for VDMA, the um, uh, Mechanical Engineering Industries Association. So we have uh, roughly more three thousand companies, both in Germany and in Europe, and we have launched a little uh, platform um, on Power to X. I'm just trying to navigate uh, my slides. Actually, it did work. Oh. Uh, okay. Um, we have a platform on um, power to x um, and I'm coming to that term um, just in a minute. Um, so we do all the, the things that uh, trade associations do. So we enable technical exchange, we shape alliances, we de develop international markets. Obviously, we do lobbying and public relations. So in our platform, there are more than 100 um, companies from the complete value chain of Power2x. Um, I'm sure you see some familiar companies here like uh, Scheffler, Sunfire, Siemens, ABB, uh, companies like this. Um, as I said, we're covering the, the whole value chain from renewable energy to the electrolyzer industry and components um, and to the application side. Um, on the next slide, you see the, the, the pathways and um, the, the of power to X, as we call it, and the ways of its applications. So increasingly in Germany and, um, and in Europe, we not only talk about the direct use of hydrogen, um, but also of um, the production of other gases, liquids and feedstock um, that is made um, with hydro from hydrogen. Uh, for instance, synthetic kerosene for aviation, um, other e-fuels for, for shipping like ammonia, um, e-fuels for trucks um, and other gases um, for furnaces and gas power stations. And, and we think that this is an important um, um, puzzle piece of, to achieve climate, climate neutrality. Now hydrogen is obviously at the beginning of all this, um, so it, this is the, one of the main components, um, the most important component to bring this um, industry alive. So we are very um, excited, um, obviously, that uh, now Germany and the EU have launched, um, after long waiting, uh, both of their, their strategies. And I will first turn to the German strategy, um, if you uh, may um, uh, change the slide, um, which was launched, uh, launched uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago in, in June. And um, well, the strategy focuses on scaling up hydrogen 
Um, there was a lot of talk of the, 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 the pathway and how ambitious the pathway should be. At the end of the day, they settled with um, five gigawatts of installed capacity by 2030 and another five gigawatts um, installed capacity by um, 2035. Now, this is all domestic. Uh, the German government expects that the, um, the need of green hydrogen will increase uh, significantly within the next 10 years uh, because of the, the, the pickup, the scale up in, in the demand sectors. And these addition, the additional need will be covered by imports. And for this, it is very important to establish hydrogen partnerships internationally, uh, for instance, in the Middle East, the MENA region, but also in Chile or in Australia. And one example for this is actually the um, 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 power to methanol plant in Morocco that um, where a memorandum of, of understanding has just been signed with the um, German and Moroccan government. And uh, we will see a lot of these partnerships um, coming in the next years or so um, across basically the MENA region and the Middle East. This is what I'm expecting. The German hydrogen strategy is based on the, um, the notion that we must achieve climate neutrality. Obviously, this, this, um, this is the, um, the goal at the end of the day. And um, the, the application, the use cases focus on, on those sectors um, that, are, that are the hard to abate sectors. So it is steel, it's chemicals, and it's aviation. So here, for instance, um, that's where the synthetic kerosene comes into play. But also in transport, more generally, um, we would expect um, the uptake of green hydrogen, um, for instance, in conventional refinery processes. And there will be a new regulation coming in. It's a European regulation of renewable energy, uh, the REG2, um, which um, basically gives an incentive to use green hydrogen in conventional uh, refinery processes. Very interestingly as well, um, there's a strong political will to phase in synthetic kerosene uh, very quickly, both in Germany and the EU. And we will see um, a blending mandate, uh, probably with a minimum of 2% of synthetic kerosene in aviation by 2030. Now, let's have a look at the regulatory measures and, and the funding, what, what will happen. Um, obviously, this is not coming um, all by itself, so we need a strong policy uh, framework for that. Um, it, the strategy um, says that um, we will have an introduction, a market introduction program for electrolyzers. So this is a tender program. Uh, we don't know yet the, um, the amount of, of money that, um, or the, the, the size of the, the funding program. Um, but uh, this will, will uh, facilitate uh, the establishment of electrolyzers um, significantly. Obviously, we also need more renewable energy. Um, this is one of the uh, big bottlenecks, um, both in Germany and in Europe, um, that we don't have re enough renewable energy to, um, to feed into the electrolyzers. And especially Germany is looking at offshore wind farms and they want to facilitate the planning, the regulatory planning, um, uh, so that uh, within the next 10 years, uh, more offshore wind farms can be, can be built. Um, uh, one of the uh, more, uh, well, more nitty gritty things is the making the infrastructure hydrogen ready, um, for instance, in transport. So obviously one, th one crucial thing is um, hydrogen fueling stations. Um, there, there's a funding scheme for that, um, but also um, adapting gas pipelines um, so that they are hydrogen ready. And um, then at the end of the day, all plants and machinery need, need to be hydrogen, re hydrogen ready. Uh, our turbine industry, for instance, is quite well positioned for that. Um, turbi the turbine industry is able uh, to, um, to burn 20%, a blend of 20% hydrogen already now in 2020, and will be able to burn 100% um, hydrogen by the year of 2030. So this is obviously all new, hide, new turbines, um, but there's also a retrofit uh, program to uh, enable uh, the gas turbines to do that. And there's a, a, a large transformation program going on for steel, for chemicals, and, and the aviation industry. Um, as I said, we will um, have an um, interaction of quotas in the aviation industry, but um, the, the German and also the, the European Commission is um, deliberating the introduction of a quota to increase demand for green steel, for instance, because um, 
this is obviously more expensive than if you have green steel, oh, well, brown steel from, from other countries or other regions in the world. Um, so um, policymakers will have to think hard on how to make um, green steel competitive and, and we will expect something, a policy mechanism for that. Now, having a look at the European level on the next slide, um, you may have heard of the European Green Deal, which is a new strategy for growth um, from the new commission, uh, the, the von der Leyen uh, Commission, and which has the goal of um, the climate neutrality by 2050, so no net um, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And the two paradigms are that uh, no person and no place is left behind. So obviously this is a very tall order and hydrogen um, will be an important component for that. Um, and for this, the, um, uh, the, the Commissioner Timmermans yesterday has published the EU hydrogen strategy, as you can see in the next slide. Um, and he um, said that hydrogen is the new rock star uh, among the energy carriers. So um, there's much excitement now in Europe um, about um, gases and liquids as energy carriers. And uh, just to have a perspective, uh, for the last uh, five to seven years, uh, policymakers only talked about how to facilitate direct electrification and now here with that strategy we have the strong commitment that gases and liquid, liquids are also part of climate neutral Europe. So I think this is one of the most, um, from politically speaking, um, one of the most important um, outcomes of this strategy. Now the, the path um, is, um, is quite ambitious I have to say. Um, it's six gigawatt until um, 2024. Uh, and then two times 40 gigawatts until 2030. Um, 40 gigawatts in Europe and 40 gigawatts as imports. Now this is all renewable hydrogen, um, meaning um, hydrogen um, uh, produced by electrolyzers and renewable energy. For this, you also have to cooperate with South and Middle East. And again, we will see um, a lot of partnerships being forged uh, with other regions in the world. We have, uh, yesterday we saw the launch of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance, um, which is a bit like the Battery Alliance. Um, basically, um, a club of, um, a couple of CEOs um, who should secure the investment and project pipeline. And as in, in Germany, the focus is on steel, the chemical industry, heavy duty, aviation and shipping. So this is where the politics component uh, comes in. So we have a look at the next slide. So obviously these are only strategies. Um, this is not a legislation, so we will have to see um, what the actual legislation uh, will look like. And there's a lot of follow up now, uh, like um, the renewable fuels for aviation and maritime shipping, where we will see how the quotas will actually ev evolve, um, whether it's really 2% or even a bit more. Um, there will be a proposal on producing CO2 free steel. Um, we will see a strategy on smart and sustainable mobility um, already by this year. And we see also uh, some funding calls. Um, the Horizon 2020, for instance, is the research and innovation call. Um, and already by the end of this year, there will be a call for a 100 megawatt electrolyzer call and um, a call for green airports and ports. So, so we see there's really something about um, scaling up the, um, the industry. And um, just to, to, um, to have a short evaluation, because um, the, you may, your, your title was, is this a gold rush? Well, um, we have to bear in mind that um, both Germany and the EU focus on use cases that are hard to abate, so steel, aviation, etc. And in, in those ca um, use cases, there's a low willingness to pay. Um, so the, both, both strategies focus on a lot of subsidies. We would have preferred an approach um, where we um, incentivize more the close to market applications and enable the um, uh, sustainable business cases. But having said all that, um, there's a lot of public money now in the pipeline. And this has the potential to really scale up the electrolyzer production and decrease the, the prices, especially if we look at the international partnerships um, with, other, with other regions where the levelized cost of energy are much lower than in Europe. 
Thank you, Corona. I know that uh, it was a very succinct to the point uh, that is, a, you know, in the shortness of the time we have today, really great overview of both policies. I know we could we could talk many hours about that. Uh, and again, thank you for the for the you know the point, which is rightly so, that this is not yet legislation, which we're hearing. I think a lot of the, the, the reaction makes you think that this is all in is written in, in the in the in the laws, and it's all a matter of time. So thank you again for that for that point. It's very relevant. Um, we're now going to be taking a, a look uh, from the company perspective, and I'd now like to invite our second speaker, Heinrich Gärtner from JP Jewel and Hartech Systems. Uh, to share his thoughts and his presentation. Uh, Heinrich and his team have been involved for, in the hydrogen industry for a couple of years now um, and have developed recently a project called eFarm, which is being dubbed uh, the biggest or largest hydrogen mobility project in Germany and is being supported here by the German government to the tune of 8 million euros. So really implementing what is the ideas behind some of these subsidies and investments we're looking at uh, be doing in, uh, to be doing in, in hydrogen here in Germany. So Hydrin, Heinrich, we are looking forward to your thoughts and your presentation. Thanks very much. As you introduced us, uh, we are um, involved in the uh, hydrogen business for several years. We did our first investment in the uh, year 2010 in a company called uh, HX Systems and uh, GP Jewel invested the first money uh, at this uh, quite early time because uh, with our background in uh, production of renewable energy, um, mainly in solar and wind, uh, we faced the problem that uh, on the one hand production is uh, almost a solved problem. That's not a big issue. It's technically solved. It's uh, uh, financially feasible. So that are solved problems, uh, what we, had to face is that uh, the distribution of energy and the storage of energy is uh, a much bigger problem and uh, to bring the energy to the place where it is used at the time it is needed um, is the challenge and uh, we, we thought about uh, several techniques how you can uh, cope with that problem and uh, hydrogen showed us uh, the biggest variety of options and uh, I think it's a, a quite good tool to solve the problems of distribution and uh, storage of energy. So, um, as, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, GP2 is dealing with uh, projects, with uh, production of energy, with um, distribution of energy. HTEC Systems brings the things a bit more together, like a company out of the machinery. We just built electrolysis systems there. And uh, though for HTEC Systems, it's uh, a much smaller part in that gold rush we have to face and we have to, to deal with. And uh, from our point of view, uh, at the moment, the market is running up and um, we are trying to focus on the problems of our customers to um, address with the right products at the right time, uh, hopefully for the right cost, uh, exactly the needs of our uh, customers. Yeah, um, I will give you a short overview what uh, we did how we developed uh, in our company HTEC Systems. Um, it's um, founded in, in 1997, dealing the first years just with uh, research in that field of hydrogen, uh, fuel cells on the one hand, electrolysis on the other hand, then started to focus on electrolysis. Uh, for the first years, uh, a lot of trial and error. In uh, 2010, uh, we stepped in as GP tool and um, gave uh, a bit more a focus to the renewable market and uh, the things that will come up with that uh, due to our view of the future energy market and um, the ideas that will come up with a, a market that consists from our point of view out of a complete um, sourcing of uh, energy in renewables and on the, on the other hand um, a lot of opportunities to do it not just centralized but partly decentralized and in a lot of places in the world. So, um, 2010, we invested, uh, we um, developed a technique of PEM electrolysis, more in the direction that it fits uh, to our production sites for uh, renewable energy. Um, in uh, 2017, we launched our first products at the Hannover Fair um, with our uh, all-in-one system, the ME350. It's a containerized solution that is able to convert with input of energy and tap water um, 
electricity into hydrogen on a basis of, on a pressure basis of 30 bars and uh, with a um, capacity of uh, roughly 100 kilograms per day. So for us, it was important to build a system that uh, you can build copy paste in the end. Um, that's one of the experiences we made in the solar business. Um, you have a lot of, um, you, have, you have a good chance to drive costs down by scaling up the sites. But on the other hand, um, scaling up the numbers is much more helpful if you want to drive the cost down. So building a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, or a big number of sustained parts uh, is the key to drive cost down. We saw that in solar and we will see that in hydrogen and we are exactly on that road at the moment. So we see uh, with higher capacity and higher production, we drive down costs a lot. And that's, um, that are the two ways, building bigger sites on the one hand and building a lot of the same parts on the other hand, uh, installing the right um, machines to um, ramp up the production, to, um, um, to make the production more efficient in the end. Uh, that is the way we are on at the moment. So we developed the next step of our electrolysis system in, in the one megawatt class uh, that was launched uh, last year. Uh, first one installed this year. And uh, what we're going to install next year, we're in the development phase at the moment is a 10 megawatt site. Uh, 10 megawatt plant. Um, so, but again, shows with, with the same technique, more or less, we can um, drive down costs by clustering the technology and um, bringing um, yeah, bigger capacity to the same site. At the moment, uh, at HTEC, we are a team of uh, 60 specialists uh, with um, two sites in Germany. Um, okay, Ben, I, I would have to ask you to go to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our production facility for our electrolysis stacks um, is in Prague near Hamburg in northern Germany and in Augsburg where our headquarters is located. Um, we uh, aggregate the stacks and all the other uh, components in our container solutions and build the systems there ready to ship to the sites. Um, to show you one case uh, of one of our customers, it's, uh, it's eFarm, it's uh, a project, uh, an SPV in northern Germany, where uh, we delivered the electrolysis systems uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, we had this week, but uh, quite actually on uh, Tuesday, the um, official opening of the sites um, with our uh, Ministry of uh, Transportation um, in, in northern Germany. And what, what the idea behind this project was, is uh, at the, in the quite northern part of Germany, uh, next to the coast of the Northern Sea, um, we have the situation, a lot of wind power. Um, with that and limited uh, capacities on the grid, um, even a lot of excessive power that we can't use all the time uh, due to limited grid capacity. And uh, this energy is uh, lost and the excessive energy now can used uh, by our, our electrolysis systems to provide hydrogen and in this case for public transportation. Under the uh, regulations that uh, are the, the existing rules in Germany at the moment, we have the situation that we um, have to build the electrolysis system in a direct connection and even a direct ele electrical connections to the windmills. Um, we produce the hydrogen on site at the windmills and we have uh, to compress it there um, on a level of uh, roughly 30, uh, 300 bars and uh, put them on trailers and trucks and bring them to the filling stations. We have five sites uh, where we produce hydrogen and uh, two filling stations, hydrogen filling stations um, to fuel the buses and uh, trucks and uh, we, we build in this uh, project there a combined filling station for trucks and cars. In the project at the moment, we have um, 50, over 50 investors at the moment, uh, public investors um, that are interested in te technology and a lot, of, um, a lot of people that try to get uh, a part of the, of the investment just to the um, fact that hydrogen is running up at the moment. It's, it's a big thing and a lot of 
people are, are interested just in be part of that business in the end. A lot of people are uh, thinking about buying hydrogen cars, are buy, buying hydrogen um, transportation facilities for their uh, companies. Um, so that is something that is uh, quite discussed there. And on the other hand, uh, what is a quite important fact for that project is that um, it it shows in a in a quite um, in a quite good way to that you can use the energy that you produce locally in the local transportation and to bring on the one hand production and uh, on the other hand the use case for the hydrogen together is a big issue, um, especially under um, under the conditions that uh, building new wind farms is always under discussion. You have a lot of a lot of discussions even in northern Germany about where to build it, about impacts on the environment, impacts on the um, people that live in that area, and uh, for that reason, it's important that it's not anonymous uh, as it used to be. But here, you can say you can use the energy that is produced locally, and that is a big issue in that region already now, and in other regions as well. Uh, we can see that this uh, example. Um, offers quite cheap uh, energy through to excessive wind power. Um, but we see those projects all over Germany at the moment. We are in discussions with uh, project engineers uh, from, uh, southern, um, from Southern Europe at the moment, uh, where we don't talk about wind, we talk about solar and uh, with excessive energy and uh, with the the peaks in the energy production, it is quite easy to produce cheap hydrogen. For sure, um, for our uh, installations, we need uh, a, certain, a certain amount of full load hours. Um, but uh, as I uh, said in the beginning, uh, with the production or with the rising production, the costs for our systems go down. And especially the PEM electrolysis is designed for uh, fluctuating energies on the one hand, and uh, it has the um, the, the fact that um, it depends a bit on the, the or the, the lifetime depends a bit on the usage and on the full load hours. So it's not just written off over the years. Uh, it has to do how long can I use it, and for that reason, it doesn't play the most uh, the most important role. Do I reach the eight thousand hours a year? We can even work with the three thousand or four thousand hours. Quite fine. Um, yeah, so far with that project, um, with the new strategies, and Carola put that together already perfectly. Um, from our uh, angle of view, in the end, uh, we see for sure that uh, with that strategies, and still it are strategies, uh, we, we are on a way to uh, a lot of sustainable business models. Um, we have the opportunity to uh, build up local business cases, uh, and that's good on the one hand, because that is a good condition to develop the technology further uh, and to ramp up and scale up the production and even uh, to do the first steps for bigger installations. Um, for sure, it won't end up with 10 megawatts or 50 megawatt plants. We will see bigger plants as well. But um, as we saw in other technologies, uh, it's, it's often good to start small, to do your learnings, uh, to, to have your lessons learned there. Uh, with smaller installations and then ramp up and build bigger ones. Um, and um, what we are um, seeing here is that the development on the hydrogen side will happen even faster than it did in solar. Um, and um, the time is right now. So gold rush, <laughs> I think, is on the one hand uh, the, right, the right noun or the right word for wording for uh, that what's happening now there. Uh, but on the other hand, still, uh, we need to have the right shovel <laughs> to get to dig out the gold. Uh, we are fighting for that at the moment, but the conditions out there are getting better and uh, the, the reception in, in the public is really good at the moment. So it is a good time to do it. And the strategies are um, announced now and it's, um, it's good for us um, here to be part of that. And uh, I think it's, it's okay that we can show already with our first cases where we have installed our, uh, our um, products that the technology is ready to be built. Um, on the other hand, there are uh, some restrictions we have to address. Um, 
like um, special regulations, how to deal with uh, electricity transmission, how to deal with um, with taxes and uh, whatnot on, on the electricity bills uh, that we can, the electricity that we use um, in our electrolysis systems. We have to address that and we have to talk about that. But there are, I think, uh, especially with the German uh, hydrogen strategy, we are on the right way at the moment. There's, uh, there are a lot of points addressed that, um, that will uh, make the life easier for our customers in the end. Um, and it, uh, I think it's, it's a good approach at the moment it's a good, a good basis for bigger and for smaller project. Um, from our point of view, we have to have a strong, um, to, to, to develop a strong market at the moment in the first steps here in, in Europe, for our company at least, and then um, head to the next, uh, the next goals and the bigger installations, then um, even overseas for sure, even in Africa, um, where for sure for certain um, conditions, electricity, costs are lower than we can achieve here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Heinrich, for that uh, precise and, and introduction and about what you guys are doing. Um, there's been a few questions in the q and I see uh, you guys have been answering them. Uh, feel free, whilst we're listening to Thomas, to also answer them. I wanted to, the questions seem to have been answered um, with regards to the specification and not, why in just wind in the north of Germany, but there's there's a story behind there, so thank you very much for that. Um, yes, and for our third speaker today, um, Thomas Kremetska, coming from a company called Anapta. Uh, Anapta has been uh, very active in the market the last couple of years, has won a number of awards, uh, I think Startup of the Award, a year, a year Award, and many others, so um, also with a very international approach. Um, so we're very interested to hear about your company, Thomas, and also your your views on what's going on in Europe. I know you guys initially started as well in, in Thailand, so uh, the, sh the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Ben, and good, uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, everyone, wherever you are. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction and invitation to share a few thoughts here. Um, we're actually very excited to be speaking uh, in this prestigious company. Normally, when you talk about electrolysis and green hydrogen, and there is a lot of talk about very big systems. So I'm glad that uh, Heinrich already prepared the ground for um, a, a different approach. Um, we like to talk about it as the modular approach. Um, yeah, my name is Thomas Kometska. I'm the head of strategy here at Enaptor. Uh, we're the new kid on the block. We're around since two and a half years um, as Enaptor. But we were lucky to pick up some patents um, with our technology from a predecessor company. And I'm gonna talk a, a bit more about that in a, in a few moments. But what you can see here is um, on this slide is that we're um, similar to what HTEC is doing. I think we're going one step further and really try to conceive electrolysis and green hydrogen as a product and ultimately a commodity. And I think um, this is a very distinctive approach of ours. So, I'm trying to control the screen here. Or maybe we just have, yeah, that works. Um, so I have only a few slides for you. I won't bore you with too much details, um, but I, I wanted to share that with you to give you a bit of a perspective of um, how we build electrolyzers. Um, this is our uh, one and only product that we have at the moment. Uh, a modular electrolyzer that is um, built so that it can be fitted in any kind of standardized rack, um, a 19 inch cabinet. So we chose that approach to um, have the fastest possible market uptake by standardizing everything as much as we can. And uh, we heard earlier already um, the modular approach coming out of the solar industry is what has inspired us as well. Uh, if you look at the solar panel, you can use one or two of the panels to produce power on an individual house, but you can also put um, megawatts, megawatts, or even gigawatts together into huge systems. Um, and ultimately, we have seen rapid cost reductions in solar, and this is due to the fact that it was basically mass produced as a commodity. Not only solar, we've seen similar uh, developments in the semiconductor industry 
pretty much wherever you have a commodity and this is the, the way that we want to go as well um, when scaling our production. So as you can see, our device has a very, um, a very good efficiency. It produces a cubic meter of hydrogen in an hour at a very high purity and consumes very little energy to do so. Um, and yet the hydrogen output is pressurized similar to a PEM system, uh, which for us is very exciting. So uh, we are using a technology called AEM, anion exchange membrane. The principle is similar to a PEM system. You have a membrane based electrolysis pro uh, process. In our technology, we're not conducting protons, but anions through our membrane. And uh, uh, yeah, happy to explain that at a different occasion, maybe in a bit more detail. But yeah, so what it ultimately allows us to do is to really focus on this um, product and be able to achieve larger sizes by, by, by stacking it up. It's a very uh, scalable approach. You can use one of the systems for, let's say, a residential storage application, but you can also stack them up in cabinets for commercial applications or containers for industrial applications. We try to conceive the product as universal as possible so that there is no limits to the use cases as well, be it, as I mentioned earlier, residential electricity storage or aviation refueling, um, heavy mobility refueling. We have industrial use cases and um, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a, in a few seconds. So what we really think is that um, a lot of people are only coming around to understand what hydrogen will actually do. I think it is not easy um, to see where hydrogen is coming from and where it's ultimately going. Um, we like to compare it to um, the solar panel, as I earlier mentioned, and if you can see in this illustration, um, solar was so disruptive because ultimately it cut off whole and long supply chains. Solar basically created the term of the prosumer. All of a sudden, what used to be a very long supply chain from uh, the center to the periphery became a very short trip. Uh, you produce your electricity wherever you needed it. And I think uh, a lot of people are still struggling to understand what green hydrogen actually means. And I think it's a bit of a interpretation battle as well. The European Commission now focus very much to put hydrogen wherever um, you know, heavy industry needs to be decarbonized. And we think this is very uh, intelligent and useful, but we also see there is a lot of other use cases that could be served. Ultimately, we have, about 30% of, of our energy consumption, global energy consumption is happening in the electricity sector, whereas 70% is happening in the fuel and gas sector. So hydrogen is the only technology that we have on the table right now to decarbonize that the segment. And I think it couldn't be any more pressing to do so. So while everybody is starting to find the use cases and the applicability of hydrogen, we think that green hydrogen will ultimately have a similar effect and create a lot of new market segments, uh, new businesses, and completely new approaches of how we generate gas and fuel. So why am I saying all this? I'm trying to stress the point that we don't think that it will be only large scale centralized production for industry that will um, find application for green hydrogen. We think it'll be along the whole value chain industry and businesses that will be using um, modular green electrolyzers if they become really, really cheap. And that's what we're setting out to do. Um, so Ben invited me to speak a bit with them, you know, European or beyond European perspective as well. As I mentioned earlier, um, many of the electrolyzer producers or players in the hydrogen industry have been around for, for a while, for 10 years plus or, or even much longer. Uh, we have been around for two and a half years now and um, we're trying to use you know, the approach of a very nimble and agile um, business and startup also in our uh, global presence. 
So uh, we started an app there actually between Italy and Thailand. Thailand because Sebastian Schmidt, the chairman of Enaptor, used to live in Thailand and he was actually a customer of a modular electrolyzer before he decided to um, get into the business and help scaling um, modular electrolyzers around the globe. So we think it is absolutely vital to have a very broad base and spread green hydrogen around the globe right from the start so that we don't need much time for a scale up at a later point. And while we still have relatively limited production capacities at the moment, and we're rapidly uh, rushing to increase these production capacities, we're trying to service the market internationally already to um, yeah, basically um, be there as soon as possible with all the opportunities that are coming up. And yeah, ultimately, um, our goal at, at Enaptor is to do our part to crush the price for green hydrogen. Um, the European Commission was talking about all sorts of um, hydrogen that could be used. Uh, we're firmly convinced and completely in line with our, um, with the other manufacturers in the industry. We truly believe that if you uh, mass produce uh, electrolyzers, the price will come down and green hydrogen will certainly be the cheapest source uh, of hydrogen compared to fossil fuels, compared to blue hydrogen in the long run. And yeah, with that, maybe I'll give the floor back to Ben and um, maybe some questions from the floor. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you for that uh, sh short presentation about what you were doing. Uh, we're going to get into the Q&A and ask all our speakers exactly. Thank you, Carola and uh, Heinrich to put back on their cameras um, and to answer some of the questions we've got coming in. Um, just to perhaps a question directed at Carola, uh, because it's a good point you made, Thomas. Uh, hydrogen and fuel cells have been around for a couple of years. It's not something that's just been found out today. Why do you think there's a, such a rush or at least so much policy now happening, whereas you know, something which could have been done 10, 5 to 10 years, 15 years ago, and, and your thoughts on the carbon issue of, of, of if that might be a, a better way of getting hydrogen into the forefront quicker, having a you know, negative impact on the other technologies? Well, I think um, with regards to what happened early on, I think that the policy scene has just changed and the, uh, the, the political objectives have changed. Um, just a couple of years ago, we used to talk about um, reducing uh, greenhouse gases um, uh, for about 80%. Now we're talking, at least in Europe, we're talking about climate neutrality. So we really need to think about those sectors, like I mentioned, aviation, maritime shipping, steel, the, chemi the chemical industry, um, the building sector, the heavy duty sector. So we, all, we, need, we need large scale and small scale um, abatement um, uh, technologies now. Um, and I think hydrogen and all the other gases and liquids are perfectly um, uh, useful for that um, and to, to scale up. Thanks very much. Just having a look here at one or two of the other questions that have come in for our from our um, participants. Uh, there was one question and then direct this, I think I'll direct it firstly at Heinrich, is the question of how long can hydrogen be stored for? Is there any limitation? I know we're talking about second life batteries and stuff like that, but is there any limitation with hydrogen? No, I don't think so. Uh, technically, there's no limitation. Um, it's more or less a question how expensive is it to store it? Um, but uh, there are uh, storage systems for quite big capacity, like caverns in the ground, or um, high-pressure, small uh, batch storages, like in cars. Um, I know that uh, the, the point of storing um, is um, an old one. Uh, it is addressed due to the fact that in earlier years, uh, the storage usually, usually was done by uh, super-cooled, liquefied hydrogen. And uh, due, due to the, that oiling off effect, we had the situation that within a few weeks, uh, the tank was empty and the hydrogen was gone. Uh, but with the high pressure vessels that we have today, this problem is solved. Now, uh, there's another question here. This is definitely directed to Thomas. I know I've seen, a, I've seen an article recently uh, regarding the cost of hydrogen per kilo. Uh, I know, I, please let the, the audience know there was a, a statement recently from an app to where, where the direction was going to go with regards to the price per kilo. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were actually commenting very much on the fact that people like to compare electrolyzers by the cost per kilowatt installed or the cubic meter of hydrogen produced. And uh, this is something where we were always puzzled why you would do that, because ultimately what the customer cares about is what does the hydrogen cost that comes out of the electrolyzer and actually judging an electrolyzer by its rated electrical capacity doesn't really tell you much about it. So um, it bugged us a little and we um, put a little blog post on our website um, where we talked about how, how we think it makes sense to have a very easy formula to look at uh, green hydrogen prices which is ultimately looking at capex over the lifetime of the electrolyzer and then accounting for the opex while uh, taking the efficiency of the electrolyzer into account. Ultimately, I think for all electrolyzer manufacturers, the capex cost for the electrolyzers will come down very fast, very rapidly. Um, and then the question is uh, much more, what is the opex cost to run the electrolyzer? So the opex cost will be the determining factor for the price of your green hydrogen. The yeah. capex um, in terms of like euro per kilogram will quickly drop to uh, levels, just the capex, to levels below the current price for uh, fossil-based hydrogen. Um, and I think by the year 2030, we will see one euro 50 to 50 cents or even below that just for the capex. And then it'll become very interesting uh, how much you need to pay for the electricity and other opex um, to produce your hydrogen. There's a question followed up from that, and I have another question for Crow in a second, but uh, the lifespan of an of electrolyzer, what, I mean, and also at Heinrich's direction, what are you, until then, he's, I mean, we're talking in the solar industry, I think, for 25 to 30 years uh, before, you know, the, 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 the efficiency drops, what are we looking at electrolyzer? I'll start with you, Thomas, because you're still on, on mute, and then I'll go over to Heinrich. Yeah, so, um, again, we're the, we're the new kids on the blocks, so... Um, our technology at the moment, we expect our stacks to last for about 30,000 hours. Uh, that is a bit less than current PEM electrolyzers or alkaline electrolyzers. We think that we will be catching up on that lifetime um, when we are mass producing the electrolyzers to similar levels where PEM are. And maybe I'm handing it over to Heinrich here to elaborate where that is. <laughs> yeah, um, indeed, uh, we have a couple of hundred thousand hours, test hours on our uh, stacks and the membranes there. Um, so the lifetime um, of, of such a stack, uh, if you, and, and it's always a question, and you mentioned it already, when is it that? Uh, it, it's going to lose a bit of efficiency. That's what we see. And we have our definitions. And usually with our definitions, we see a, a lifespan of 40,000 maybe up to an 80,000 hours, but that's, that's then um, in total. And then it's, um, it's the end of, of life uh, with our definition. Uh, that means it depends a bit on, on the way how many hours uh, per year do you really use it? Um, what is the, the exact use case where it is uh, implemented? And for that reason, we talk about 10 years or uh, maybe a, a 15 years lifetime of such a system. Um, on the other hand, and that's what uh, Thomas already mentioned, uh, the costs, for, um, for the CAPEX and for the electrolysis systems are dropping and even the costs, or especially the costs for the PEM stacks or, or the AAM uh, stacks are dropping. And uh, for that reason, it's, it's, uh, uh, I can imagine that the economic lifetime is, the end of the economic lifetime is reached earlier than the technical end of the lifetime. Mm. Understood, understood, I know exactly what you mean. Um, and, and, and one question for Corolla. Um, we're talking in the, the plans, the strategies that have been released, a lot of research. We've heard from our companies today, we're looking at scaling. How much, I mean, it's, it's not, a, as I said before, it's not a new topic. We, we, we have done research in the past. How much do you see being needed still to be done in the research and how much is actually just getting started and scaling and, 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 and focusing on production techniques to get us to where we need to be? Um. Well, I think the, the, the colleagues from the, the companies um, should uh, follow up on that. But um, my impression is that with regards to production and electrolyzers, um, we've done our homework. Uh, or the companies have done their homework. Um, so uh, the, the objective should really be uh, scaling up, industrializing the, the production lines, um, maybe learning a bit more about efficiency, uh, things like that. I think with, um, with regards to um, research, uh, the, the question about the use cases is more, more interesting. 
using hydrogen in steel making um, is something that is um, is something that will transform the industry. Um, but I think um, there still needs to be done some 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 research. Um, and um, also with regards to um, the question, what is the best fuel for shipping mari um, for maritime shipping? Will it be ammonia? Will it be methanol? Uh, again, here uh, we we will see some some further well research and development um, that has to be done. Um, but other than that, I think it's really about getting getting the um, the the electrolyzers to the ground, scaling up, and uh, building bigger scale and more electrolyzers. Uh, yeah, I would, I, would love, I would love to jump in. Yeah, because it's like very much in the DNA of our company um, to to continue do our and R and D. I think we're still at the very well, we're not at the beginning, but we have still so much room for improving our our technology. So uh, we will be producing patents and new technologies, um, more efficient technologies, longer lifetimes, and also. You know, not only uh, um, hydrogen production technologies, but um, use the the AEM technology platform to provide more solutions. It's very exciting, and it's also a matter of where where we take some learnings. For example, from the solar industry, um, you could argue that maybe not enough was spent in R and D in the early years, um, and we definitely want to um, do our share to advance R and D. Yeah. Uh the same for us, not much to add. Um, I think uh, that we are still in a quite steep part of the learning curve uh, and we can improve a lot um, by building the next systems and um, really, um, yeah, with ramping up the production. Uh, that is the, the big point here. Uh, that's the, the biggest lever to drive costs down. Um, so getting better systems, better lifetime, uh, lower degradation, um, cheaper uh, components um, and faster production. And on the other hand, uh, what, what we are looking into is uh, how to drive the system in the end, because there are certain situations like overload situations or overproduction uh, or special temperature situations that have an impact on the lifetime and for that reason, then again, an impact on, on the pricing. So that uh, altogether is in our focus at the moment. Uh, the, the purpose of HTEC is indeed to make the conversion from electricity into hydrogen as cheap as possible. And so that's in our DNA. And uh, for that reason, that's exactly what we are working for. There was a question here said uh, was regarding the typical efficiency loss that we're seeing in electrolyzer play. I know we touched on that subject a little earlier. Uh, the question is, um, is that a question to be answered per year? Or as Thomas mentioned, I think you said something like 10,000 hours. I mean, when we have a solar panel on our roof producing energy, we might use that energy straight away. We don't need to store it. And when it's being produced, we then we store whatever we don't need, and then we have something for the evening. So is that the right way of looking at it per year? Or do we need, to, we need a different thinking in terms of hours of usage? Or, you know, is, is that the right question to ask? It, it's one way. <laughs> it's one way to to, to deal with it. And um, for our company, for HTEC Systems, uh, we do it in in a in a similar way. Um, our uh, boundaries of uh, the of the lifetime technology wise is uh, indeed similar to the systems of uh, solar panels. So we are uh, our our definition in the end is again uh, a twenty percent loss of efficiency, and that then usually is end of end of life for our stack. It's similar to solar panels. Yeah, so would you like, uh, sorry, I'm saying, uh, Thomas, do you have something to add? No, it's going into the same direction. Our current degradation is probably still a bit higher, um, but these are the levels which I think you just see in electrochemical processes. Um, you always have some degradation. I fully agree with what Heinrich said earlier. You always have to decide, like, look at what is the economic uh, end of life and the actual uh, technical end of life, which will be very important for decision making. Now, I know we're getting to the wards, the end, we're almost, and our, our time is up. I'd like to um, ask one kind of forward looking question, and I'll start with Corolla. I know it's a bit mean, but you did speak first. Where do you see things in the current project, uh, projection of the industry, of the, you know, the taking into account these policies? policies, where do you see us in the next five to 10 years in Europe and, and perhaps 
what are some of the, some of the lessons learned for the looking at the perhaps the American market where we perhaps don't have as much movement, but we might see some things that could be adapted. What what is your feeling? Are we have we made the right step finally towards becoming a hydrogen society like Japan's aiming or was aiming to be have done for the Olympics? And, and what are your thoughts for the, for the for the market here in Europe for the coming years? Well, I think um, the, the strategies point to the right direct direction. And I think in the next um, five or six years, we will see um, more demand for hydrogen, which is um, important um, um, for, for, the, for the industry, obviously. But um, I also think that um, this will attract interest um, from other parts of the world. Um, so, so our vision is that it will actually start to become a more international uh, econ hydrogen economy, um, where not only hydrogen, you can, hydrogen is um, it's difficult to transport hydrogen um, when you don't, don't have a pipeline. Um, but different um, forms of fuels and, and, and liquids like ammonia, methanol, um, and things like that will be transported um, from, one, from one, one end to the other um, and for different needs. So I think we, we are at the beginning of a new kind of industry. Heinrich, I'll give the word on to you. What is your or was told us by the German side. Heinrich, your 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 view and, and what you've seen and what you've heard the last you know, last you've seen the last years, what you've heard the last few weeks, and what your your vision is for the next few years. Yeah. Um, so the the future is bright. Uh, I think uh, with hydrogen, um, we are on the right path at the moment. Um, to, to say the other words, without hydrogen, the energy transition to a renewable world is impossible. Um, that, that just can't work. Hydrogen plays the by far biggest role in energy storage in the future uh, and all products that are made out of hydrogen for sure, but hydrogen is always like a spider in the middle of the of that uh, network uh, of the energy world and uh, for that reason we will see a lot of hydrogen uh, production sites uh, on the world. We will see a lot of um, technique that deals with usage of hydrogen and uh, storage of hydrogen and so that is exactly the right moment for such a hydrogen strategy for Germany, for Europe, and I think for a lot of other countries. For sure, um, there are other ways at the moment that are cheaper under the certain conditions in, in like in the United States at the moment. Um, at the moment we see, for example, just uh, let it mention a high, uh, high tax or high price for carbon dioxide, the, the way how to produce and uh, how to distribute energy will change. Um, oil and gas uh, and all fossil fuels have that uh, carbon uh, backpack at the moment with them uh, and if you want to get rid of that and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, big parts of the, of the whole world will, will see that and uh, attack that issue um, then we will switch to a hydrogen world and for that reason we have to prepare ourselves today. It's like a quite compressed spring at the moment it will unfold uh, in the very near future and we have to prepare for that because I, I think I mentioned it already. It will happen quite faster than the solar development. Thomas, closing remark on your side. Yes, uh, lovely question. You can uh, say a lot of things to this, but I'll, I'll try to say only two things. One is I fully agree with what uh, Heinrich said, too, but um, I, I would like to highlight Let's keep in mind 20 years ago, if somebody would have said like solar will be the cheapest source of power within, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, I mean, not many people would have expected it. And what did it do to the markets? How did it disrupt the utilities, right? So you don't need to be a visionary to see like where we have, we have only one commercial viable technology to mainstream decarbonize fuels and gases, and that is hydrogen. So I think that sometimes there's a bit of a lack of vision to what is possible and what that will generate. So I think it is very difficult to speak to how the future will exactly look like. Um, and that brings me to the second part. We're glad that Germany is putting together a national strategy, that Europe is putting together a strategy. And it's always easy to talk about, you know, what's wrong with it or good with it or what could be better. So we really like to say, like, we just focus on ourselves. If we are capable to produce green hydrogen or green or electrolyzers to make green hydrogen, that is at the top of the value chain and will enable everything that is coming afterwards. Sure, of course, we need, you know, less regulation and, you know, no EEG surcharges on electricity, but it's not, nothing that we can do. So we're glad that all other players are in the game to doing their part, and we're trying to do our part, which is drive down the cost. 
I know there were some other questions, but unfortunately we're at the end of our webinar. Uh, we've, we've exceeded the one hour that it was given to us. All uh, that's left for me to do is to say thank you, of course, uh, to the three panelists, uh, Corolla Kanz, Jaime Gatner, and Thomas Kremetska for their time and their thoughts. Uh, and of course, to the audience for joining in today. We do have two further hydrogen webinars, uh, one titled Best Practices in Hydrogen Safety at 2 Eastern Time, and then our Energy After Hours Hydrogen Expanding the Field at 6 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, but please visit our website, have a look at what's going on at events.solar, and kick through our Think, Engage, Connect, and Register there. Um, and of course, just the, uh, uh, the, the notice that our, our main event, Solar Power International, ESI, and North American Smart Energy Week will be taking place on the 21st and 22nd of October outdoors in Las Vegas, but will also be virtually possible. Uh, thank you all again for your time. Uh, good luck with the coming weeks and coming months. All the best. And again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye.